Killing Heroes Prologue Year 17,001,050 The music stops as the DJ brings the current song to a screeching halt. Shock, awe, and terror are the only available expressions for the onlooking crowd attending Lois's party. I have just delivered the final blow leaving Clark dead at my feet. Friday the 13th, Summer 1050, was the day I killed my former co-worker Clark Kente in cold blood at a house party. This assassination was the highlight of my life that set me on the path to become the greatest hero. At first, I didn't know that I would become the next greatest superhero. It all just fell into my lap. But you know what they say, don't you? Come great power comes great responsibilities. This is the story about how, I became a hero. Chapter 1 My journey to become a hero started on day 1 year 1. It was my first Saturday night on the darkest side of a crime-ridden city known as Bloodhaven. Luckily, I was not alone. Midas and I arrived through the rainbow prism at the same time. Back then we were lost as to who we were, where we originated from and how or why we arrived here. At the time we were suffering from a severe case of delusional retrograde amnesia along with PTSD, impulsive delusional disorder. As we all know, retrograde amnesia is not a curable condition. Only traumatic incidents can trigger or restore our lost memories. Therefore, I cannot go into details about my past life before the portal. I am not sure how old I am either, I can tell I am many years older than Midas judging by his youthful appearance and wrinkle-free skin. He is unsure of his age as well, but he swears he's older than me. We haven't aged much since we've been here, so it's hard to tell. The people in this world however appear to age and die rather quickly in comparison to us. They come, and they go. I've witnessed countless souls that I consider to be friends and enemies die at the hands of time, and even my own. I was not the hero you see today. Back then I wasn't a hero at all. I was too poor and self-centered to be considered one. I didn't wear spandex, or a cape, or risk my life to save another person. Let alone a human's life or a creature whose life I felt was inferior in comparison to me. I'm not the product of a science experiment gone wrong. I wasn't given my powers by another motherfucker either. My body possesses otherworldly powers that I will not explain or go into detail about, yet. To keep my abilities simple, my hands are the epitome of violence. These hands are smooth to the touch and terribly destructive. I'm still learning new ways to utilize this power of mine. I am a walking god, secretly living amongst you. Or at least that's what I proclaim myself to be. Although I technically cannot fly and I am not invincible, my supernatural abilities are dependent on solar and lunar energies. I have no idea how it works or why but it does. Which is why, I'm also hard to kill and catch, if I'm running away. A few have come close to defeating me, but no cigar. I always manage to make a last minute comeback, escaping from the clutches of death, sometimes. Chapter 2 Year 1 After three days of roaming Bloodhaven aimlessly, Midas and I established a headquarters on the east side of town in the alley where the mysterious Rainbow Prism portal closed on day 1. Within, the first six weeks, we learned the time and money system. We had more time than money in those days for sure. This, prison of a planet that we were forced to call home, is known as Earth. This planet Earth, revolves around a central star called Ra, and it rotates 360 degrees in a 24-hour span. The Earth year consists of 365 days, and the year is broken down into 940 day months. The documented year at the time was 17 million, 500. We use the season and hundreds place for daily determinations. Springtime year 500 was the current time period when we arrived. During the early years Midas and I didn't know we possessed God traits. We learned along the way as we interacted with the world around us. In this crime-ridden city known as Bloodhaven we strive to obtain the six key elements for survival. Food, shelter, money, weapons, power, AC. Any order is fine, though with trial and error, I learned over the years you should start with the power first. Midas and I, encountered countless factions in pursuit of our true identity. These factions were predominantly gangs, organized crime groups, and outlaw guerrilla armies, drug dealers, and ultra super villains. This was during the feudal Marvel era, when mutants dominated the streets like psychopathic warlords. With the many sociopathic street gangs and ultra mutant villains, destruction murder and mayhem plagued the nation of Bloodhaven on a daily basis. Though the gangs were at the bottom of the organized criminal hierarchy, what they lacked in organization they made up for in madness by the numbers. They were high in numbers, extremely reckless and bold, at the time I was oblivious as to the reasons for the many killings. The random killings caused by gang activity occurred so often, that the civilians began arming themselves to defend from their many violent outbursts. 
which in terms made them indistinguishable from any other gang. The homicide rate was high in these days. Back in these days they didn't have a corpse or rotting or necrotized earthling removal service. A coroner as you call it in the future. Human and mutant remains would be buried by loved ones, or left to rot in the streets. The deaths occurred so often that the authorities couldn't keep up with the many bodies that littered the town. Despite the many odds Midas and I kept our noses out of everyone's business, until the summer of 501. When the summer of year one arrived my life changed, setting me on this path to become a hero. I'm a hero. Chapter 3. Summer of Year 501. When the summer of year one hit, Bloodhaven was everything except cool. The summer season peaked blazing temperatures of 130 degrees during the daytime, and 110 degrees at night. Every day throughout the month of Julius not only did the temperature rise, but violence increased, by 60%. With a daily average of 110%, this city became even more bloodier. Midas and I were practically burned alive as we panhandled throughout the streets. The smell of the grilled corpses that littered the streets and empty lots was becoming unbearable. I had to do something about this. I felt it was up to me to clean up the streets by removing the corpses once and for all. Searching my immediate area, I discovered an abandoned lot that I chose for my mass grave. Using my hands, I dug into the earth like a dog, scooping out large mounds of soil until I formed a pit. My hands tore through the soil with ease, as if it was made of rice. Surprisingly it was too easy. After 4 hours of slashing the wall surface, I have created my 10 foot wide by, 20 foot deep pit. Now. All I had to do was locate each corpse in the neighborhood and toss them in. With the power of my nose, I was able to smell all cadavers within a two-mile radius. I searched the area for the corpses that littered the streets, and drug them back to my pit one by one. Eventually I obtained a wheelbarrow for the hauling. After two days of cadaver hunting, my hole was half full, leaving the streets completely clean. After handling the corpses throughout that month, I stumbled onto a supernatural ability of mine, that I then turned into a hobby. My hobby became puppeteering. Chapter 4. Puppet Act. My first supernatural ability that I discovered about myself was, that I could bring corpses to life like a puppet. These corpse puppets would cast their voice through my mouth like a ventriloquist, allowing me to speak for them. I called this ability the Puppet Act. I would play with my puppets for hours at a time under the overwhelming sun. I would absorb as much information from the deceased puppets as I could before the green light diminished from their eyes. Once the light diminished, they were gone forever. In that time span of 10 minutes the corpse puppets would give me the details of their former lives in the form of a comedy routine, in which their jokes were riddled with facts about their personal life. I soon came to understand the benefits of this ability. My next goal was to exploit it. I showed Midas my puppet act once, but he wasn't too impressed. He said it was too creepy and cringy. He also said my jokes were too offensive for women and I should never consider being an entertainer. He said that word for word. But what the hell does he know? He couldn't understand why he kept pulling things out of his pocket like a magician. His negativity didn't stop me from mastering my puppet act. With fame and fortune in my sights I gathered a few fresh corpses from the previous day to start my career in show business. All I needed was a niche audience. Like the many great performers before me, I took my show down the street attempting to book my puppet act at local bars and nightclubs. When I approached my first vendor, at the Stack Deck Social Club, Everything was going fine until I was impolitely escorted from out of the club via the window. Although I sat bleeding on the sizzling pavement on top of scattered glass shards, I was not angry for revenge, or ready to fight. I was confused. I did not expect this outcome in my many mental simulations. I then sat on the curbside and reflected on my failed negotiation over and over in my mind. I introduced myself, shook his hand and told him my name, and what my act was going to be about. He had his questions mainly what's that smell? I told him what the smell was as I revealed the corpse in the black trash bag, he called in his goons and they threw me out the window. I didn't give up there. I went to another vendor and received the same outcome. Then again and again. From time to time, they would simply point their weapons at me, demanding me to leave the premises. By this time, I had been rejected so much I felt it became custom for me to escort myself from one of their many exit windows. I was a failure stuck in the cycle of madness. Perhaps I was indeed going crazy and the heat had fried my brain. What if it was all my imagination and the corpses never were talking to me? These were the many questions that plagued my mind. The negativity from the world around me, led me to begin doubting myself. After a few hours of silent sun gazing, I realized what I was doing was simply ahead of my time, or completely unethical. But, in this chaotic city what was ethical? That's when I decided to put my act on the back burner to continue my mission cleaning the streets. 
hoping that one day in the future the world would become more open-minded, and there would be a demand for this type of entertainment. Tears slowly dripped from my face as I tore the limbs from off of my puppets as I tossed them into the pit. After one month I have finally cleaned the streets of our neighborhood, leaving the air fresh and the streets clean from decomposed bodies. That's when Ra turned the heat up a notch. I had just completed my mass burial when the heat started to exaggerate. That's when I had an epiphany. What if I had died and this place called Earth is actually hell? I said to myself as I imagined the 150 degree heat waves transforming into pure fire. The theory made sense. The many mutants with demonic tendencies, countless dead bodies, and it's hot as hell. This heat was the epitome of hell on Earth. I needed to go somewhere cool. That's when I conceived a new scheme, which led me to McGrady Lundy and Sons Hospital. Chapter 5. Hospice. The hospital was a top-notch 50-story medical treatment facility, that was not too far from our headquarters. The building was practically across the street. That's when the greatest idea came to me. I knew the plan would have resulted in repercussions, such as potential brain damage or a minor concussion, but I didn't have a choice. The plan was simple, severely injure my dues, just so we could stay in the hospital during the daytime to avoid the heat. Yes, I know what you are thinking and the answer to the question you are thinking is no. We did not have health insurance. Why? Because we were homeless at the time. We were full-blown homeless, living on the streets of Bloodhaven. The headquarters I mentioned previously, was actually a dumpster that we cleaned out and stacked bricks around it to look like a house. We did all we could to do to survive. This was not living. The hospital plan was going to be our way of moving up, or so I thought. After pitching the idea to Midas in my head, we were ready to get into character. I armed myself with the firmest brick I could find in our alley, and began my assault. Striking Midas across his head clank. My breathing became heavy and my heart raced as I watched him stumble to his feet. I wiped the profuse sweat from off of my brow with my forearm as I looked up to the red afternoon sky. I have to hit him harder I said under my breath. Midas, stumbled away holding his head in his hands, as he mumbled words under his breath. Something along the lines of stop hitting me, I think this is enough but, he said it so low, I pretended I didn't hear him. I wiped more of the profuse sweat seeping from my skin from off of my face slinging it to the ground. The large droplets splashed onto the floor only to vaporize as it evaporated on contact with the concrete. With a glance across the street, I witnessed the many injured and sick trauma patients on their way inside the hospital. They were practically flaunting that air conditioning. I'm going to get in that hospital if it's the last thing you do today my dudes. I shouted as I looked over to him, I'm sorry I said crying and sniffling, as I grabbed my dudes from behind. I raised my melee weapon into the air to continue my assault. Forgive me, or not I said with my hands firmly grappled on the back of his neck. Bink, clack, clink. Along with Midas' screams were the many sounds that I began to tone out, as I visualized the both of us in the waiting room relaxing in the cool AC. I continued painting my mental fantasy as I bashed him in his head repeatedly, and relentlessly. I admit I did get carried away. In my defense I was determined to put my friend in the hospital properly. I wasn't going to stop until the brick crumbled in my hand. After 26 solid wax plus a finishing blow pow, the brick had finally crumbled, filling my palms with red gravel and dust. Just as the brick crumbled my knuckles had inadvertently made contact with his head. Then his head cracked open like an eggshell. Oops I said as I reflected on my actions. It must have been the brick. Adrenaline coursed through my veins and into my heart like a nuclear generator. Something, had come over me. Something about this incident felt oddly right yet extremely cruel. As the excitement and confusing energy washed over my body, a euphoric sensation came over me. I looked down to Midas as he laid on the ground in an unresponsive state. My dudes. Are you okay? I asked turning his apparent lifeless body over to inspect my work. Blood poured from out of the gapping dents in his head. Perfect I said to my dudes as I tossed him over my shoulder. With no time to waste I toted his limp body to the hospital. Upon entering the medical facility, I noticed the long line. I skipped the line to get ahead of the many weak pathetic losers that were nowhere near close to dying like my good friend Midas was. As I approached the receptionist, I tossed Midas on top of her desk sending her computer tumbling down to the floor. After a 9 second stare down, the receptionist calmly reached for her phone. Can security please escort this rude bum out of the facility? That's when I snatched the phone from her. I took a glance at her name attack to apologize about my rude entry. I'm sorry Harriet. But my friend here was attacked by a madman and we need a cool room with a doctor, and please skip the police report. He looks fine to me the receptionist said pointing her nail file towards my dudes. I turned his body around to see he had already awakened from his state of unconsciousness, 
and there was not a single shred of evidence that depicted an injury had occurred. I then grabbed Midas by the collar of his shirt to give him a touch-up elbow to the face. Hiya! I shouted crack knocking his jaw off the hinges and causing his neck to crack and go limp. He was finally unconscious again. Look at him now, he doesn't look too good I said to the receptionist trying to convince her to give him a second prognosis. After a short 10 seconds or less Midas woke back up, rubbing his realigned jaw. I was flabbergasted. How did he do that? I asked myself. I inspected his face to see golden streams that flickered like electricity throughout his face correcting his injuries. His mandible automatically realigned itself, followed by his neck as it rose to an upwards position. The blood that drained from the top of his head dissipated into golden flakes that carried away into the air like ashes. Then, his eyes opened, fascinating I said to him as I studied this paranormal phenomenon. That's when I discovered Midas possessed a magnificent regenerative healing ability. This also means he wouldn't stay down or remain injured long enough to give us access to a room with AC. Which now means it was going to be up to me to take one for the team. We fled back to our headquarters to begin working on plan B. On our way back to our headquarters I kept my eye on my dues. Something about him was peculiarly different. Chapter 6. Midas on the high horse. His face was the same, along with his body and height. However, his gait was different, so was the strut in his shoulders. And his accent was that of noble old English. Many questions plagued my mind about what exactly had just happened. I could have sworn I just killed him. Then he popped the question. So, who are you again? His question caused me to stop in my tracks. I looked Midas in the eyes and gave him a fake name. I told him my name was Boss. Still, he could not recollect who I was. After a few seconds he popped another question. Do I know you from Croya Mr. Boss, you look awfully familiar, he asked. No, and what is Croya, was my reply. Not what but where. It is the place of my birthright. It's my home Midas said with a sense ambiguous confidence. No, Midas this is your home I said as I revealed to him his actual home on earth. The dumpster with bricks stacked around it, tucked away in an alley. This ran down atrocitized dwelling of a trash heap is not my home he shouted. I thought he was crazy when he chose this location from the start but, now he had really lost his mind. I have a castle, and a whole city to my name. This type of dwelling will not suffice my needs. Then he looked to me saying, how would you like to be my best ridden? In return I will grant you all the land for you to dwell. You can be the king of your own little nation Mr. Boss. What is a best ridden? I asked. Midas replied with a chuckle more or less someone or something that helps one person get from point to another. You help take me home and I will grant you land, along with enough booty dogs to last your lifetime. This is out of generosity of my heart, and as a king I will honor my promise to you. Then he stepped closer to place his hand onto my shoulder. I will be honest Mr. Boss the distance is far and it may become a burden on your soul. If you are strong physically, and mentally then this will not be too much to ask from you. Looking into his eyes I can tell he was being serious. My reply was sure, thing might as I will be your best ridden. The pitch was solid and it sounded like a win-win. I would only need more clarification on what a booty dog was exactly. Breaking down the roots words alone suggested something that did not seem too comfortable. And yet, I felt like I was also losing my mind for agreeing to deal hatched by another man that has recently lost his mind. As I said I was naive to the world around me in those days, and desperate. Anything sounded better than this dead end life I had going for myself. You're a smart man Mr. Boss. We shall leave now. Time is of a matter of extreme urgency. Now come quick we need to go to Croya immediately he demanded before hoping on my back and shouting off with ya as he pulled my hair. I was not going to carry him to his fantasy world. I tossed his ass from off of my back with the quickness. Oh, really what's the name of this so-called magnificent city? I asked calling his bluff. He, was sounding terribly delusional. It is called the city of power. When he uttered that name, it struck a nerve deep in my mind. The nerve caused me to have a minor headache. Then my mind was flooded by a haunted lost memory. It was not a clear what the memory was but, it was as if I could vaguely visualize the city he mentioned. I was drawn into a faint vision of a vast blurry city that was being bombarded with massive explosions. In the background there stood a golden castle that was visible and clear as day. Then came the blurry figures that were screaming my name. Then I snapped out of it. After taking notice to our headquarters, I realized the shape of our brick dumpster hybrid home did indeed resemble a castle. Was it a coincidence or an embedded instinct? I turned to my dues, to see him get to his feet. I guess gravity and reality had finally introduced themselves to the king. We are not doing that plan my dues. 
Maidu stepped in uncomfortably too close to me placing his nose into my neck. You have already sworn your life to be my best ridden. You cannot break an agreement with a king. That Mr. Boss is a death sentence where I'm from. I was not going to let delusional Midas intimidate me so I retorted. It's not about where you are from. It's about where you are at. King Midas and right now you just aren't there. Slap he slapped me. I have just spared your life. Let that be a reminder to you of my mercy. And Mr. Boss why is it so hot? This was going too far. After a few minutes of bringing Midas up to speed he was primed with enough information to continue his new life as my sidekick. I informed him about his magic pocket trick, and showed him his little seven arm training punch stick thing. I never mentioned this but he is a rather amazing craftsman. He can create anything from out of his pocket, if he has touched the required materials to create it. Which means he cannot create something if he has not physically touched it before. That's why we were so broke he couldn't pull a hundred dollars out of his pocket because of the materials required to make money is not called money. You would need the exact cotton and linen materials along with mixing agents such polyvinyl alcohol. Then we would need the exact chemicals used to make magnetic ink. The alchemy that occurs within his pocket has to come from an organic source. He would need every ingredient that is required to make money before he can produce it. Otherwise, he would only produce knock-off dollars. Even if he was to physically touch a $100 bill, he would only be able to duplicate the same note. That comes off as counterfeit money. Trust me we have tried it. Now it was time to get back to work. I updated Midas about our recently developed hospital plan. He had his questions, like why are we doing this? I simply told him so we will have a place to stay fit for a king with air conditioning servants and a bed. Looking over my shoulders I could see the blazing photonic heat from the sunlight was inching its way into the alley. We were running out of shade. Find something in your pocket and hit me with it. When I'm unconscious take me to the hospital, once there we will relax in one of their many accommodating rooms. When I wake up, we will work on your plan to Kroya. Is that understood? Striking first is not the way of a king. Remember your place in this world. I said before, how I punched him. His face crumpled inwards, then his face filled with golden electricity once again. In no time his face was back to normal. I inspected my fist. Either his face was too soft or my hands were too hard. Midas checked his face with his finger and thumb. Okay, I understand boss, you want me to put you in the hospital he said, with a grimacing smile. Midas dug deep into his pocket to search for the most optimal object he could find, and behold he retrieved a crowbar with a chic golden candy cane coating on it. I remember feeling my heart skipping multiple beats as he wrapped his fingers around the base of flashy crowbar. The intensity in his eyes did not indicate a sane individual. Just one good hit okay. Do not overdo it I said to my dudes. But I said it so low he probably didn't hear me over the sounds of the metal striking the brick castle. Midas gave a few practice swings towards the ground, chipping away pieces of concrete from off of the surface. I hope this works he said as he then turned his aim towards a poor defenseless, fire hydrant. Maidu swung the crowbar as if it was a golf club, striking the hydrant. With each pulverizing hit generating foot-long sparks, as the two metals collided with great force. After nine strikes, the crowbar had begun to bend and warp. During the final blow the hydrant was lifted off of the ground releasing a pressurized spray of water that began to shimmer over the street. That water fountain was the last, most spectacular sensation I had ever experienced that summer. After three seconds I was drenched. All of the blood, dirt, sweat, and tears washed from off my body and my clothes, as I stood with my palms out basking in the cool downpour. I stared in awe as the mist formed a magnificent rainbow, that stretched across the sky. The cool refreshing water rained down onto my skin, putting my mind and body to ease. All of my worries were gone. This water fountain changed everything. You are a genius I said to my dudes. My dudes, we don't have to go to the hospital anymore I said as I turned to my dudes. But, before I could finish my sentence, I was already unconscious. Chapter 7 The Mad Doctors After an unknown period of pitch black nothingness my chest inflated as my eyes have finally opened. I was only able to see through two circular openings, that limited my peripheral vision. Everything was still spinning as I faced the window view of the night sky. The bluish black empty space that was sprinkled with distant stars and the large full moon. The moon had an ominous feeling to it. It put me in a trance that felt as if the lunar rays were dancing within my eyeballs. From behind me I started to hear the sounds of many machines being turned off. Square ceiling tiles, a privacy curtain, an infusion bag and a medical bed with rails that was handcuffed to both of my wrist. Rolling my eyes left and right looking to the ceiling and walls, I could deduce I was in a hospital room. This means my plan had worked 
and all I would have to do now was get out. But I couldn't budge my body, I was too weak to move. Then I sensed the presence of another person tiptoeing in the dark room. The unknown assailant crept silently as he, she, for it, approached my bed from behind. Get one last good look at the night sky, it's, going to be your last the mysterious assassin said chuckling in the silhouette of darkness. Judging by the voice it was indeed a male. The unknown assailant injected an unknown brown substance into the intravenous infusion pump, that hung over my left shoulder. Out of curiosity, I watched as the glowing brown liquid traveled through the clear tubules into my arm. My eyes zoomed in onto the vial in his hand. Succimethonium is what was labeled on the vial. Instantly my body began to feel cold, and even more paralyzed. The assailant had just graduated to an assassin. He then tossed an electric plug over my bedside. I've been waiting for an opportunity like this for a long time, now you may die and go to hell in peace the assailant said as he silently waited by my side looking towards the window. The room became dead silent. After a long 40 seconds of silent moon gazing, I decided to pop the question. Are you talking to me? I asked out loudly, startling the would-be assassin in his tracks you're still alive he said as he shrieked stumbling backwards over a mayo stand as he fled from the room. That's when my vision began to get blurry as my eyes closed shut against my will. Then it all went black again. Though my body was in a paralytic state, I could still hear my surroundings vaguely. Suddenly, light began to penetrate through my eyelids as the sound of unfamiliar voices began ringing in my ears. This patient is under my care Lundy said the blur at the foot of my bed, to the second blur with an overwhelming fragrance that was hovering over me. He replied saying the general wants him for a classified project. Everything else was too classified, but he did mention something about the leak. It's okay Lundy I know the details. Slowly my eyelids began to open like uneven curtains, as the brightly lit room came into focus. Panning from right to left I am face to face with four doctors. I was surrounded. Looking down to my wrist I noticed I was also handcuffed to the bed. You managed to pull through says the unknown doctor standing at the foot of my bed. Where am I I ask as I attempted to raise my heavy bobble head. The team of physicians gathered to assist with lifting me up to a 90 degree angle. I took a glance at my hands to reassure myself I was not dreaming. I squeezed my weak hands into a fist until my hand inspection was interrupted by the voice of the man in the white lab coat, standing at the foot of my bed. My name is Dr. Van Dorian. Sir you have been a guest in our facility for some time now. Can you tell us your name? I could have told him my name but, I wasn't. I simply told him I can't remember I said lying through my teeth. Do you remember what happened to you before you arrived here? Said the well-dressed doctor to my right. I struggled for a moment before I began uploading my most recent memories into my third eye. Little by little images started to pop into my mind recreating that fateful summer evening. It was hot. Too hot I remembered that scorching hot day like it was yesterday. Then, there was a rainbow and a water fountain, then. I dramatically paused for a few seconds, leaving the doctor on a cliffhanger. Then what? He asked anticipatingly, awaiting my next word, so he can document my dialogue in his personal journal. Then there was darkness, and after that I do not remember. Did you see who or what hit you? The doctor with the loud cologne to my right asked as he too documented my words in his journal. I took a deep breath, to dive deeper into my memory. I recall after the rainbow, there was my twos, swinging that god awful crowbar. Then he struck me. After that I cannot recall anything else. I assume I was only struck once. Then he must have brought me to the hospital as planned. Either way what happened to me wasn't important anymore, because I am still alive. I'm not going to snitch on Midas for following orders. Nope. I don't remember anything I said as I place my hands onto the cool smooth surface of my head cast, as the physicians to my right positioned a mirror into my point of view. I focused my eyes onto my reflection to see my head was encased in a large egg-shaped cast. What did you do to me? I shouted. Sir calm down when you arrived you were suffering from an extremely traumatic severe head injury. How severe was it? I asked out of curiosity. The doctors looked to one another before breaking the news to me. The doctor to my right with the loud cologne stepped into my view. Bro you were fucked up. Your forehead was torn off from the brow up he said placing his left and right index fingers on both sides of his temporal lobes. That's not all the physician says from the back of the room. We had to sedate your body four times a day to prevent it from causing further harm to the hospital staff. Your body began twitching uncontrollably. That's when the doctor to my left leaned in closer to my point of view. You struck several staff members while you were in your coma he said with a grin on his face. I'm sure they are okay, right? I say in defense to the leaning doctor. The leaning doctor's face molds into a grimacing frown as he looks to Dr. Van Dorian. He 
he stepped away from my bed to join the bearded physician that stood in the background. I've studied metamorphosis over Josie's condition for over 30 years and I have yet to come across a subject such as yourself, Dr. Van Dorian said happily as he transitioned to sitting at the foot of my bed. In my many years I have witnessed the many capabilities of the mutant class. Over these dash, human or creature, physiology that I have encountered in my life see. In this world all living things abide by a series of rules that are key for survival. No pulse means no life. You need a functional brain and a heart for the average human to be considered alive. Then I must be a super mutant? I said proudly. We theorized on that idea, but you don't possess the mutant genome the oversized doctor shouted from the background. When you arrived, you were like my colleague said fucked up. You were also malnourished, dehydrated, and suffering from vitamin deficiency. I wagered you would have been dead in a matter of minutes. I was wrong, and lost a ton of money on that wager. You were dead but you weren't dead. I figured all of our work would have been a waste of time. Even if we did manage to suture your brain along with its neural network, then maybe, we had a chance at reviving you. Then your brain tissue began to decay. We worked around the clock to reconstruct your brain into anatomical position along with your cranium. That procedure was still deemed impossible by my standards. And yet, you still maintained a pulse. Which led us to our next roadblock. The source of your heartbeat can you feel your heartbeat patient 001? Dr. Van Dorian asked. I placed my hands to my chest to feel for my heart. Thump thump. It was there. Yes I feel it I say in sarcastic astonishment. Judging by your injury I assumed you were a victim of a sever gang on gang quarrel. Until the man that brought you in gave us more clarification. I realized you must have had it coming. During your surgical procedure your body went into terminal shock then something terrifyingly bizarre occurred. We cannot say exactly what happened, but you struck a few staff members, killing them on contact. My son included, the shorter doctor in the background shouted as he stomped his way back over towards my bedside. I could see his angry face through my two peepholes. The doctor took a deep breath and exhaled, pausing as he removed a marker from his pocket. The upset doctor reached over my bed and began scribbling something onto the front of my cast. Whatever it was that he wrote made Dr. Van Dorian and Dr. Lundy break their professional demeanor for four seconds. The unknown doctor popped his marker top back on, placing it back into his pocket. I said we should have left your homeless ass to die. If it wasn't for Van Dorian and Mr. Lundy. The doctor paused as he began sniffling. Then the tears poured from his eyes. Today, I was ready to throw my entire career away to kill you in cold blood. Then I was giving the order to transport you to this floor. Today was my chance to avenge my son. I brought you to this room. Then I pulled your plug, opened the curtain and waited for you to die. Then you woke up the doctor shouted as he stormed out of the room. What did he write on me? I asked Dr. Van Dorian. It says get well soon he said with a light chuckle. Sir there, are more important issues at hand. Like what? And who the fuck are you? I asked pointing at the red-headed well-dressed physician hovering over my right shoulder. I began to focus on his mischievous smile. Excuse me? Mr. A Dr. Van Dorian stepped in to introduce the doctors in the room. My colleague to your right is the world-renowned Dr. Carlswell Lundy, he happens to be the world's most experienced medical practitioner in the field of reconstructive surgery. His family also happen to be the owners of this magnificent facility along with 5,000 other facilities around the world. The dramatic gentleman that stormed out, his name is Dr. Keith Stewarts. He was merely being metaphorical about pulling your plug. I look over my right shoulder towards Dr. Lundy to see he has just finished plugging a cord back into the wall, turning the life support machines that surrounded my headboard back on. Aside from his friendly smile he has the sketchiest vibe emanating from his exterior. I took one sniff of the immediate air around me and I was disappointed, he didn't smell like money, his cologne was fragrantly loud but I could still smell that stench of a mutant in him. I leaned back onto my pillow attempting to place my hands behind my head cast. Who are you? I asked speaking towards the large sized doctor in the back. That is doctor. I'm doctor busy he said cutting Dr. Van Dorian off. You did something to my fiancé, Dr. Jessica Auschwitz busy during your reconstructive surgery. Can I ask you a question? I do not mind if you ask me a question I replied mocking him. Where did she go, when she vanished? The giant of a man asked as he pointed his sausage sized finger to me. Is that a riddle? I do not know what the hell you are talking about Mr. Busy. My name is Dr. Busy and you better put some respect on my name. Where did she go? Dr. Busy shouted. I was telling the manic doctor the truth. I have the slightest clue as to what happened to your wife. I was in a coma. Where have you been Mr. Bizzo? I was being honest, kind of. You used some sort of sorcery whilst you were in your unconscious state. With you having amnesia well, 
That's rather convenient and unfortunate Dr. Van Dorian said as he stared into my eyes. How would you like to be a pioneer? He asked changing the subject. A what? I replied attempting to sit upwards in my bed. Dr. Van Dorian stood up to walk towards the window. Leaning onto the wall with his shoulder he began pointing to the city streets. A change is coming to this world in the years to come. This change will bring the world that you know to a perfect balance. Outside of this window, countless lives are lost day in and day out, due to the bloodshed and carnage caused by the violent mutant class. With the newly formed unified government, we can finally put an end to it all. This is where you come in. The unified government is currently working on a top secret project, in which we are assembling a team of unique individuals like yourself to combat the threats that oppose the unified government around the world. We would like you to be on our beta draft. Picture yourself traveling around the world, on clandestine missions discreetly removing high-profile individuals from power. You will be under contract the command of General Hohenheim Van Dorian. The UG is willing to waive all fees and charges you've accrued over your stay, including the nine lives lost during your coma. Nope I shouted to the doctor allowing the pee to pop. No. The doctor said with a perplexed arch in his eyebrow. I watched as his facial expression shifted from a calm flower to a cold stone. I will not be your guinea pig project. Ask your mutant friends here to be a part of your league of extraordinary guinea pigs project I suggested pointing my fingers at the two men. My words caused Dr. Busy and Lundy to look at one another. Sir these fine gentlemen aren't violent mutants, and if they were, then I must be the dumbest man in town with an intellectual score of 400. Dr. Van Dorian pauses with his eyes locked on Dr. Lundy, as he asked me his next question. How would you know if they were mutants or not, he asked with the head of his pen primed onto his notepad. I pointed my finger towards Dr. Lundy's head. The aurora that seeps from off of everybody like steam. That is my determining factor. Mutants have more. Are you telling me you do not see the aurora? Dr. Van Dorian placed his glasses firmly onto his face as he attempted to see it, but he could not. If I can't see it with my own two eyes then it does not exist. Perhaps you're merely seeing things, hallucinations just so happen to be a common side effect of the medication you have been on. I was confused and low-key disrespected. What about their smell? It's different, that is the simplest way I can put it. I tell the doctor. Mutants smell like mildew and tree sap, usually I say staring at the large man in the back of the room, as Dr. Van Dorian stares at his suspicious colleagues. If I were to tell you I was a mutant, then how do I smell to you? I took a deep inhale of the air around me causing my head cast to implode inwards. I then began processing all scents that were in the room. Like a balloon my cast inflated as I exhaled. You are not a mutant I can tell that by your aurora, and you smell like hydrogen, oxygen carbon nitrogen, oranges, and salty hot dogs. The big guy over there smells like fermented barley. And this guy with the loud cologne smells like carbon hydrogen nitrogen and a moldy casserole and a cactus mixed with hot dog water. After a moment of silence, the doctor trio began laughing upon my conclusion. I was confused and low-key disrespected. Dr. Busy stepped in saying sir you're pretty intuitive. That was a pretty impressive and entertaining demonstration of mutant abilities he says laughing sarcastically. What the hell is so funny I ask. Nothing it's just, first you remember what happened and now you have amnesia and you can remember what mutants smell like. I think you're just a delusional liar. Me be a liar? That's impossible, everything I know and believe is based on my true life story. Who the fuck does this guy think he is? I said to myself. Who the fuck do you think you are? I had to shout that out loud at the top of my lungs to the oversized physician. Calm down you have been in a coma for four years. It is common for coma patients to wake up in a state of confusion. But I was not confused. Wait, I've been out for four years? I asked in total disbelief. It felt like I was asleep for only a few long hours. Well, some things are just embedded as instincts I say scoffing. Your instincts are wrong Dr. Busy says folding his arms. In your deduction we all smell like oxygen, nitrogen, carbon. What about potassium and magnesium or sodium? Yes, you smell like that too, how did you know that? I ask wondering if he too possessed this keen ability. Sir that is because that is common knowledge within the medical field of biology. The human body is comprised of the elements you mentioned. Van Dorian turned his dialogue towards Dr. Lundy. Dr. Lundy can you recall what we ate for dinner an hour or so ago? I look to Dr. Lundy to see what he has to say and how is it relevant to the subject at hand. I believe you had a hot dog, and an orange soda. Dr. Busy had his usual 40 ounce of mauled liquor. I had a three day old cactus casserole, and a bottle of hot dog water. Perhaps your keen senses are able to determine what a person had for dinner. I'm not sure if the U.G has a need for a low tier ability such as that. Fuck you Dr. Van Dorian, and the two of you. I shouted cutting him off. 
I don't care about your project, or what you ate for dinner, or where your bitch went. All I see is a trio of knockoff mad scientists accusing me of sorcery, and murder in my sleep. I mean, coma. I said correcting myself. When I take this cast off of my face everything better be in place or you will be paying with your lives. If I don't get you my lawyer will. He's the best lawyer in town. My lawyer is so good by the time he gets done with you guys, this hospital will be mine and you three will be working in Alaska. So, dress warm. I said as I sat back and folded my arms after delivering a monologue, I plagiarized from a movie I saw before my coma. As I said delusional liar Dr. Busy said with a hearty chuckle. I was fed up and ready to go. I don't want to hear any more offers or fake sympathy. I am alive and well, therefore, you have all done your job, thank you and I will be leaving now I said as I pulled the intravenous lines and electrodes from off my body and arms. Are you sure? You haven't even heard my final offer Vandorian says lifting his glasses from the tip of his nose. I said no I shouted, tossing my blankets from off of my lap. I swung my thin legs over the edge of the bed placing my bare feet to the cold smooth tile floors. Dr. Lundy swooped in to secure my transition to stand suggesting. You should take it slow and reconsider our offer. You have been in a coma, for over four years, and you murdered nine staff members in that period. We are being rather generous. My reply was, I don't need generosity or help. I just survived a life-threatening head injury, a coma, and an apparent assassination attempt. It's going to take more than that to keep me down. Now let me the fuck go Dr. Lundy I demanded pulling my arms from out of his grasp. My legs wobbled at the knees as I rose from the bed. After four years bounded to a bed, my legs were like boiled noodles. Everything fell far, including the door that was five feet, out of my reach. Then I folded my arms. There I stood in place clenching my leg muscles along with my tarsals. With my ten toes planted firmly down I was like a pillar with the ultimate foundation. As for the doctors, they were astonished by my apparent swift recovery. Then I took my first step with my left noodle leg. Though I stumbled I managed to recover my balance quickly. My muscles were a lot weaker than I had imagined. It was as if I was relearning how to walk all over again. The doctors watched in awe as I exceeded their expectations on coma recoveries. Or, my bluff was taking effect, and now it was beginning to, wear off. My knees felt like two broken chopsticks, balancing 50 gallons of water in a trash bag. I realistically could not see myself walking out of this facility. However, failure was not a luxury I had at that moment. I had to get the hell out of that hospital. The time came for me to take my second step. I paused allowing myself to gain more balance before taking the next step. Are you sure you do not need help Dr. Vandorian asked pleading with me with a pair of crutches in hand. My response was leave me the fuck alone I got this I shouted as I gave him a menacing grin. Then I lifted my right leg forward. During that instance I shifted my weight to my left leg, like I have done thousands if not millions of times before. Then something inconveniently painful and bizarre occurred. I lost my balance and fell forwards. Within an instance my reflexes kicked in as I attempted to catch my weight with my left knee. But as I said I, was weaker than I had imagined and my body folded over, then snap. The snapping sound was, my left leg as it, hyperflexed inwards causing my leg to break at the knee, causing me to collapse onto the floor. My heart began to race as that painless cold liquid silver sensation traveled through my leg into my brain. Are you familiar with the pain sensation, of any sorts? Pain is a very complicated physiological and psychological process, that involves hormones and chemicals. Pain is transmitted through the body with the help of nociceptor nerves. Nociceptor nerves work with your autonomic nervous system to send a damage report to your dorsal horn in your spine. The dorsal horn then relays the signal to the brain. After your brain confirms the damage report, your brain then signals the thalamus to relay the report to the cortex. The cortex processes your brain's pain memory library, by determining where the pain is coming from and if this pain is familiar. Once the cortex has analyzed the damage report, one final message is sent to the limbic system. The limbic system is where your reactant emotions are housed. It's the reason why my heart has elevated, why I pass out so easily, and why I cry. Then came the tears. Damn you limbic system I shouted silently within my subconscious. I pressed against the floor, lifting my torso upwards. Looking towards my waist I could witness with my own two eyes the cracked, dry ashy sole of my left foot. I collapsed back onto the floor wishing my limbic system would go into unconscious mode so I can reawake with this injury taken care of in the future. Then everything went black once again. Thank God for the limbic system. Chapter 8 Blessing in Disguise After another unknown period of unconsciousness, I had reawakened once again. 
Then came the same familiar voices and unpleasant fragrances. First thing I visually noticed was that, I was still on the floor. The second observation was of the doctors. They were still standing around like they were off the clock. How long was I out for, was my first question. Dr. Van Dorian looked to his wristwatch as he gave me an exact time mark. Almost 9 seconds. I looked below myself to see the sole of my foot was still facing me. My eyes rolled all around in my head until I came with a conclusion. That conclusion was asking for help. I raised my heavy bobble head of a cast upwards, to see Dr. Busy reaching his hand to me. I stared upwards towards his hand, before coming to a prideful conclusion. I don't want your help, I want Dr. Van Dorian I shouted as I leaped from the floor to slap. As I weakly reached to slap his hand out of the way with all of my might, I felt something in the process. It was like an exchange of energy from his hand to mine. Except it felt as if my hand faded through his hand, which led me to fall to the floor. Crack. Then somehow, unknowingly I had broken Dr. Busy's entire hand. With his fractured carpals poking from out of the backside of his hand, he dangled his mangled hand into the ceiling light in total disbelief. I wondered how long would it take before his limbic system kicked in. After a silent moment of eye gazes from doctor to doctor, Dr. Busy began crying like a bitch as he cradled his shattered and flappy hand with his opposite hand. He then turned his body to face me as he cocked his foot backwards into the air as if he was going to kick a standing field goal. Obviously in this scenario my head will be the football. My eyes were locked onto his foot, but he stopped in place. You piece of shit I wish we could've just killed you. Letting you die would be too easy. I hope you get raped on prison he shouted as he left the room in a panicky rush. Van Dorian shook his head silently, in disbelief. As he made his way to the door. What the hell are you shaking your head for? Where do you think you are going? Get down here and help me. I shouted to Van Dorian. Hoping he would take the bait so I can try to high five him. Dr. Van Dorian gave in to me. He reached his hand out to pick me up. I locked my eyes onto his hand. Then I made my move. As I did before I pounced from off of the floor to swat his hand. My hand was mere centimeters from his hand before Dr. Van Dorian did the unthinkable. He was indeed keener than I should have given him credit for. With a swift pullback from his hand, he brought his hand up towards his forehead to coolly wipe the top of his bald head. Leaving me to miss his hand entirely, leaving me to fall to the floor empty-handed. Sir you have left me with no choice. Once you are processed and admitted to leave you will be transferred to the UG Mutant Correctional Facility, for the murder of the nine medical staff members you killed during your surgery, and assault for the doctor you just injured. May demigod Jesus be with you he said looking down onto me as he exited the room. Van Dorian did not attempt to persuade me any further, and with a simple head gesture towards his fellow colleagues, they all exited the room. As the door swung open, I could see many uniformed officers and military personnel awaiting my exit. Dr. Lundy began talking to an unknown military general. The remaining doctors followed his lead. Don't drop the soap Dr. Keith Stewart said as he tossed the pair of crutches several feet away from me before he exited the room. After several minutes alone on the floor, I hear a courtesy knock on the door. A pulchritudinous blue-haired woman peeped her head into my room. I took notice of her name tag as soon as her breast entered the doorway. Harriet Million was her name. As I stared at her shimmering blue hair and overly proportioned breast as she helped me into my bed. Instantly I began to dream about a life with a woman like her. My fantasy came to a stop when she began her line of dialogue. Now that you're finally awake I can get this off of my chest. You need to get that shirt off your chest I replied with a light chuckle. I didn't mean to say that out loud, but it slipped out of my mouth. Wow after four years those were your first words to me. She said as she took a hold of my leg and knee to inspect my broken leg. I'm surprised you're even alive you Frankenstein looking murdering piece of shit. Despite her rude approach, I chose not to antagonize her any further. Whatever happened to hospitality, and hierarchy of needs? I said hoping to strike some sympathy from the health practitioner. Crack. My leg popped as she realigned my leg. I wanted to cry she saw my eyes water but the tears were being held back. Silence filled the room as she looked down on me. Why did you kill my husband? She asked calmly as she began to wrap my knee with an ace bandage. I didn't kill anybody Harriet. As you can see, I even have an alibi, I was in a coma. I replied explaining myself. You were alive. She retorted pulling a number 10 scalpel from out of her pocket. My eyes locked onto the blade as she placed it to my wrist. All, of your scars are gone she said as she rubbed her fingers onto my wrist your body was still alive even though your head was torn halfway off. I was there when it happened. My husband was the only doctor willing to save you. The rest of us insisted we threw your homeless ass back into the streets. Then you got up and started crawling. When we tried to stop your headless body, 
you used some kind of sorcery that made them disappear. Then you struck my husband Dr. Million, causing him to die instantly. You barely touched him. I've never in my life seen anything like that. He started bleeding from his mouth and nose. Then he died on the spot, like that. She, said with a snap of her finger. No last words, no I love you Harriet, just dead. I must have injected you with a fistful of tranquilizers in hopes that you would simply overdose and die. But, no I put you in a coma instead. There was enough tranquilizer agent in one of those syringes to put the Sandman to sleep. After many months of me going to the board to have you executed for killing my husband, Dr. Van Dorian authorized an outstanding promotion as long as I dropped my discrepancies with you. After I received the promotion, I began to realize something. You were blessing in disguise. What? I asked in total surprise. With the slightest touch you killed my staff along with my husband and that god-awful tramp Jessica. Deep down I was going to get him for it eventually, but you took the burden from my off of my shoulders and did it for me. I can say demigod Jesus works in mysterious ways. It left me with a lot of shoes to fill, and a whole lot of money thanks to his accidental homicide insurance policy. She said as she made her way to the door then she stopped. Oh, and have fun in prison, and be sure you do not drop the soap with those weak legs of yours she said giggling as she exited the room. Her last words plagued my mind with mystery, as I attempted to decipher her cryptic message. Drop soap, weak legs this prison soap they speak of, must be extremely slippery. But, why are they so concerned with me dropping soap? I'm not that clumsy. Perhaps I should have thanked her for her advice. Chapter 8 Blessing in Disguise